Good day, everybody. My name is Peter Sneijman. I'm talking to you from South Africa. We are part of Christian Camping Southern Africa, which involves some of the Southern African countries other than South Africa. We're very fortunate to have uh, these other organizations or countries joining uh, the last few years. The session today that I'm going to talk to you about is about adventure-related experiential learning. In your context, you may know it as adventure-based learning, but our research in South Africa would like to support the concept of adventure-related experiential learning. Specifically looking at some program considerations in this, we are get so comfortable and used to the way we present our programs that there may be some components or, or segments in our program that we don't focus on appropriately. This session I know would be looked at and observed by people that's quite professional and really in this industry or ministry for quite some time. But it may also have some people looking at it that may be going into this as novices. This session would be typically for both of these two audience. The session is also going to look specifically of in being more intentional in how we design our programs in order to make sure that we address the appropriate need of our session. The outcomes for the session is specifically going to be to sensitize adventure-related experiential learning practitioners and ministry in the way we consider the different factors. To discuss theoretical AEL principles, adventure-related experiential learning, in the way we uh, uh, compile our programs. And to create an awareness of being sensitive again and making sure that all the factors are considered and the whole program is kept in mind when we design and structure these learning uh, modules. Now, when we present programs and we would ask ourselves, did we accomplish the objective? Did we fulfill that which was expected of us? How do we get a sense of success and a sense of accomplishment? Now, currently, this industry is very emotional. When you ask somebody, how did you experience the program? The typical reaction is, wow, it's been awesome. It's been amazing. It's been such a blessing. It's been unforgettable, fantastic. These are the typical reactions we get from people attending our programs. Very seldom do we get an overall expression of people's experience in a negative way. But when we start to break up that program in various components, we do realize that there's areas that we neglected and that we can, that we can attend to. So sometimes the fact that this is an emotional um, uh, 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 module or an emotional medium creates a sort of a skewed perception of the outcome because people are positive about it. But there's many components that we need to evaluate to make sure it's been successful. So when we look at the program, we need to first ask ourselves, what is the expectations, needs and objectives of our population or the people coming to us with us? The church, the school, the congregation, the youth group. We need to make sure that we address it appropriately. If we don't meet the, in in the intended outcome with the eventual outcome, if those two are not balanced and compiled, if there's no line between them, we've got, we've got a challenge. What do we want to achieve? That's our first question. That's our primary measurement because everything, all those positives and all the different breakups could be part of that, of that outcome. And we need to make sure that that is clearly defined. It is a series of factors that's considered and actions or steps in order to achieve a particular result. So it's about factors in this processes, but there's a variety of things that we need to consider. It cannot be to address a specific need like trust or have a better relationship with your parents or with God or with your community. There need to be more. We need to break down our objectives into smaller components in how we address that. So when we look at our expectations and needs, number one, we need to look at the expectations of the client and organization. What is the expectations? What would they like to see at the end of this? What is the participants expectations? Because the participants expectations and the organization expectations are different. What is the expectations of the service provider or the facilitator, the organization that's presenting this service? You know, how are we used to presenting programs? Because if people will come to my site, I've got specific expectations. I've got specific expectations based on my previous programs. So it's important to, to keep that in mind as well. 
Very important to consider is the need of the participant in relation to the expectation of the participant. We need to make sure that they, that, that is also kept in mind because your expectation, your need may be, may be different and we need to make sure that those two are aligned. The other one is the need of the client and organization in relation to the expectation. Now sometimes, and I'm sure you guys have seen it, that if somebody would come to your site, the church, the objective that they've got for that specific program and the objective of the participants are not the same. So two different groupings or two different structures in this group that visits your, your program may have different expectations and perceptions of the outcome of that program. And it is important that you align that from the beginning. You need to make sure that that's part of the way you look at the future of your program or where your program is going into. Now, one of the things I'd like to point to you as part of our considerations, if you take the uh, exploration of the outward bound process that was initially developed by Wells and, and Collins, and later uh, McKinsey had a wonderful uh, adaptations to that. If we look at that, there's different stages and steps we need to consider. Number one, it's the learner. The learner is put into a specific physical environment. They are given a specific, in a, in a specific social environment, so they're part of a specific group. They are given certain problem-solving tasks. They experience a state of dissonance. They get this activity. They've got a conflict in themselves about, you know, what was given to them, their own perception, how it's going to be turning out. Then there's a process of that leads to a mastery of certain skills and competencies. There's a reorganizing of a person's meaning of, of how do they perceive things and how do they see the future and who they are in that. And that process then gets forward. So this is a very good model to observe and say, what do we need to keep in mind? What do we need to consider the process of putting a learner in a specific environment with a group of people, giving them some problem solving op op activities. They go through a process of adaptive dissonance. They go through a process of mastery some new skills, and then they go back into society and apply those new skills. It is, if you look at the principle, it is about the participant, the place, the group, the activity, the facilitator, and the process. If we keep in mind these factors and we plan around these factors in our program, we will be successful. Of course, each one of them combine and include quite a variety of factors and we're going to address just some of them today as part of a process of sensitizing the, the viewer around those things, but also to make sure that we are more intentional, intentional about the participant, intentional about our place and how it looks like, intentional about our group and how our group structure looks like, intentional about the specific activity, intentional about who's the facilitator, and intentional about the process, putting everything together. Because remember, when you look at the process, the process, when those youngsters first hear about the program, the first time when somebody shared to them, we are going to this and this campsite. This is the program that we're going to have. It's about the church and how we see how we see ourselves in the community. As soon as that, that seed is planted, your developmental process, your learning process starts. Because those youngsters, they've got a specific orientation about how they experienced the previous camp. They're sitting with some baggage about previous experiences, which can be positive and negative. But the process already then starts. It doesn't start when they get off the bus or when the parents come and drop them at the site. It starts way before that. If you look at the bigger picture, this is a typical example of how the bigger picture look like. You've got your outcomes. You've got your considerations. You've got your applications. Is it for ministry, recreation, education, development or therapy? Are these components part are you, are you marrying, for example, ministry and education or ministry and development? How are you combining those components? Then the activities that you present to them, the reflection phase that they go through, the transfer of learning to, in the end, get to the initial outcome. So it's a whole process. You can add a lot of different components into this model. There's, um, there's a variety of factors. We're going to talk about them now. But this is typically that we need to keep in mind. In order for us to say, this is where we want to get to, we need to, to funnel all these different components. Our first discussion point is around the participant. 
Now, there's a various things we need to consider about this. We need to be intentional about who are these people attending our program, the age group of these people, the skill level, the values of the specific individuals, the previous experiences that they've had, the personality types, the cognitive ability. How difficult can you make the programs? Where can you have the engagement? Because, you know, you want to present some level of, of challenge but you also want to make it accomplishable so that these people can in the end feel, wow, we've accomplished. So you need to know what is the cognitive ability of these youngsters or older people or, or adults. A willingness to participate. Are they there because they want to be there or were they forced to be there? Are they going to say, yes, we're all for this. We are OK with the program. We give you our consent to participate. Or are there some resistance? Something to be considered. The physical ability, how physically engaged are they? What is the level of physical engagement? The preferences, if you look at the whole brain thinking, left brain, right brain preference, are we, are we considering all those dynamics? Are we structuring a process for typically your left brain people? Are we structuring a program for typically right brain people? Or are we dominating into a certain area uh, because of who we are and how we think things should happen? The learning styles, are we considering the various learning styles, interpersonal, intrapersonal, um, music, visual, spatial, uh, naturalistic, the, all those, do we consider those components when we design programs? Again, if we want to be intentional about the participants, do we engage them in all those areas? The ethnic and cultural uh, orientation, do we consider where they come from as a, as a cultural group and how that grouping think and how they engage? The ability to affirm him or herself. We need to consider that because we need to present some opportunities for people to affirm themselves. For the silent guys to give them a platform to speak out. For the verbal guys to, 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 to silence them a little bit and then to stand back. As well as other diverse factors that we need to consider. When we look at the place where we are going to, it is important that we ask, have they been there before? What is the previous experiences of that experience? Um, have they done the same activities that we're planning now? Or do we have something new for them? How novice is this? Have they been into the city yet? Have they been into a woodlands area? Have they been at the, at the ocean? Have they been at a, at, a, at a lake? You need to ask that question because remember one of the philosophies or one of the principles of adventure-based learning is the fact that it must be novice. It must be a new environment that they get to. What is the dominant colors and smells that these youngsters are exposed to? You know, what, 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 what is that they, that the sensory system are taking in when they get to that site? Is there a pine smell that's around? Are there some boiler rooms that creates a, 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 a charcoal type smell in the air the whole time? Is the, how close is the kitchen to these youngsters? Do they smell the food? You can think this is ridiculous, guys, but all these components creates a holistic experience that we need to consider and be intentional when we structure programs. What do they see on arrival? Is there intimidating structures? Do they see the higher up scores when they drive in? What does that create? Does that create a sense of excitement, a sense of fear? What, what does that create on arrival? Um, the atmosphere when they arrive. How friendly are the people when they're received? The facilities, the balance between comfort and struggle. What do they see? What type of barriers are there created about the facility or the place that people, you guys, need to break down before you can start? Remember, as they get from the bus, a lot of times these prior perceptions, these baggage that they come to, a lot of times we need to work through that before we can say, right, so now everybody is on the same, on the same level. We can now start with the program. What type of care and quality are there in the facilities? What do they see when they around that factor when they arrive? It does not need to be bling bling, um, but what do they see with regards to care and quality? The other factor that we need to consider is the group. We need to consider the social compilation of that group. What is the dominant the dominant areas in that group? The dominant people in that group? Are there some cliques that form? The climate in the group, is it a group where everybody's um, collaborating or is there some resistance? There's a, there's a, there's a, the, the, the phases of group development are in the, they're in the storming phase. We need to know that when they arrive at, at your center. The demographic balance of the group, where do they come from? Who they are, the balance, are there more youngsters, more older people, more males, more females? That balance, 
have an impact on your overall program. It has an impact on how Johnny experienced the program being a, part of a group of 40, 50 learners. All those considerations because you need to make that part of your planning in your program. The number of participants, how big is the group? How big is the group divided in small groups, in the bungalow sizes and so on? Does the youngster, the individual disappear in the big group? Or is there an atmosphere where each individual is still recognized in that bigger group? Um, or is it, is it about the group? Is it about the big number that we've got that we totally forget about the individual that is so important in the programming? Um, the ethnic uh, and, and, and cultural balance of the group, we've spoken about that. Uh, the, the group pressure, the small groups. What is the group pressure? You know, who are the people? Are the group balanced with regards to age and gender and so on? Uh, or is the balance skew that individuals are, are suppressed, that, that they cannot be themselves, that they cannot, cannot express themselves because they were, they were teamed up into the wrong groups? Um, the full value contract priorities. When we look at the group, what are those priorities? When they set up the full value contract and they decided how they're going to practice um, uh, how they are going to conduct themselves, what is the group culture and atmosphere that they're going to present. What are those components? Did you make sure that although you gave, gave them the contract to fulfill and you gave them the authority to, to, to create the rules for them for this excursion, did you make sure that they include all the principles to ensure that the total practice of your group and of your, of your session will be on par and people will feel uh, involved and engaged? Uh, challenge by choice climate. You know, do your facilitators know the exact meaning of challenge by choice? Do they present some alternative activities for someone that's too scared to do activity A? Do they give some more advanced activities to somebody that's running through the activities? For them, it's not a challenge. They've done this so often. It's not new. It's not novice. Do you have a next level? So are we practicing challenge by choice with the group as we should? And then, of course, the spiritual maturity of the group. What is the level of spiritual growth? If we want to make the spiritual connection, if we want to relate all of this to God in our relationship with Him and, our, and, and the future with Him in our lives, what level is this group? Do we, do we pitch it here or do we pitch it here? Where do we pitch our metaphors and our transfer of learning with regards to the spiritual journey that we've got. So we need to know what is the spiritual maturity of the group. We need to know what exactly um, is the typical norm and that we can use as an example. Then there's the activity. That is another factor that we need to consider. Whole brain orientation, facts, forms, future and feelings. Again, what type of activities are there that address the facts? Form, future, feelings. Do we engage them in activities that address whole brain thinking or con consideration of the whole brain. Um, the activity type, diversity levels and learning styles, we've touched on that, but if we look at the activity, do we plan and design activities so that anybody that came to your site can say, you know what, although I'm a visual spatial or I'm a numeric learning style, I, there was enough for me to also experience my preference and my dominance, but I've been given an opportunity to challenge and stretch myself, in, myself into other areas, thinking a little bit outside the box, forcing me in a gentle way, in a guided way, to think in areas where I haven't been, which is not my preference, because that's important. Remember, whole brain thinking is not about saying, this is who I am and I'm comfortable there. We need to challenge these youngsters, because to live a successful life, you need to be thinking in a whole brain way. Um, the combination of activities, what is first, what is last? How do these activities progress to the next level? We need to keep that in mind. We cannot have uh, an activity without a specific intent because you can have a more complex activity before an easier activity based on your outcome, based on your intent with your process. But it's important that the sequence is, is taken in, in, in consideration. The cognitive, emotional and physical level that's required for all those activities. So again, when you look at your activity, you look at your group, you look at your individuals, who are we? Where are we? Can we structure the same activity on a different level so that it address different cognitive and physical levels so that everybody feel involved? Um, the individual and the group, important to consider with the activity. The activity or components of the activity. A lot of times when we look at the activity, it's important to break down that activity in smaller segments. Because remember, you see the activity like that. 
or let me use an example of a fist. <clears throat> this is the activity. But the components, the learning components are numerous in that activity. We can deal with it like this. But if you really want to be thorough and you really want to be intentional, you need to look at that activity in the different factors or components. Then we need to look at the metaphoric potential of that activity. What is the metaphoric transfer that we're going to get to? Whether it's ministry uh, orientated, leadership trust, whatever the topic, but how can that activity be transferred into a real life situation or in a familiar situation with an applicable metaphor? Did we think through it? If you look at, for example, at a climbing wall, you look at the dynamic on that climbing wall, you look at somebody belaying, somebody playing a supportive role, there's a support line to the person climbing. Who is the person climbing metaphorically? What does the rope represent? What does the process represent? What is the setting up of that rope course, of that climbing wall? What does that intend? What is, what is the metaphoric relation to that? What is the, what is the um, metaphoric connection that we can make with the fact of looking at this objective, looking at this challenge, not knowing what is the support, the communication that's going to happen. There's so many different components that we can break down. If you look, for example, at the spiritual reflection of an activity and how to combine that activity into real life things. But we need to break it down. We need to look at each component and we need to look at it beforehand. Because remember, you can either brief it from the beginning or you can brief it at the end. You can have reflection or you can have a situation where you in the beginning sort of give the scenario to them and you frame it from, from the start. So the other one that we need to consider, the other factor is <clears throat> facilitators. The question is, what is the energy level of those facilitators that you have in front of them? What is the personality and the maturity level of those people? What is the age group that they are paired to? Do they... Do they have the skills and abilities to work with youngsters? Do they have the skills and abilities to work with older people? Maybe with everybody. But how do they relate to these youngsters? The ability to identify with a client. The skill level and diversity of skills. Can these people, were they trained in all the modules that you want to present to them? I've know, I know of a lot of situations where the facilitator was skilled in area A. Not B, not C, but in D again. And then because they were given a group, they were said, you know what, we know you're not trained, but, you know, go for all of those modules. We'd like you to present it. That is dangerous, guys. We need to make sure that the facilitator is trained in all the areas that is presented, all the activities, all the processes, all the behavior that we like. Remember, we want to be intentional. We want to consider all the different components and factors. The ability to enforce discipline is very important. You can be the most wonderful facilitator, but you will, you cannot have the ability to enforce discipline. So that's another thing we need to, we need to look at. Um, how able are these facilitators to improvise? Can they, when they're in a difficult situation, can they improvise and, and come up with some new ideas to make the situation work? They've got, there's a time lapse now where they are sitting around with these youngsters. There's nothing on the program. Can they improvise to create a scenario where these people are then engaged in the program? What is the trust that these facilitators have from management, pastors, teachers and students? If these facilitator, this facilitator, this guide, this leader, activity leader, this instructor, whatever it's called in your environment, if they stand in front of you, if they stand in front of the teacher, is there a trust relationship? Do they seek for a trust relationship or don't? They, they're awesome with the children, but they struggle to relate with the adults or are they well-rounded? Something we need to consider. And again, then, very important. What is the spiritual maturity of this youngster? Are they able to relate the spiritual process, the spiritual growth process to these youngsters? Can they connect the activity with the real life um, scenario? Could they connect? Can they connect scripture? And I'm not just take, talk, talking metaphorically. I, I'm talking about a situation where this youngster have a moment with Holy Spirit. Can they make that connection there and relate that so that there's a, an experience that this youngster will take home with them? Or are they themselves so underdeveloped or um, inadequate, feeling inadequate to their relationship with God that they cannot make that connection so that they miss these wonderful opportunities of relationship?
So our next and last process or next factor, which is actually, in my view, one of the most important ones is the process. That's the glue. How does all these factors come together? So we've spoken about some of these components, but again, the activity sequence is so important. What is last? What is first? Did this process ensure that these youngsters were taught certain skills in activity A, how to address activity B, to address activity three, so that there's a sequence of growth in the process. Does the process accommodate that or not? Is there recognition of progression of activities in the process? Uh, the progression of activity and complexity regarding cognitive, emotional and physical components. So does these activities not only, not only in, enhance the process of learning something new and equipping them for the next, for the next, for the next, but also is there a progression in complexity with regard to cognitive, emotional and physical uh, functions? How does the time allocation look like? Is things so cramped up that, that time is an issue? You know, we don't even get to, done, to do activity one because we need to move to the next one. If that starts to happen, the process of growth is, is hampered. It is, we are neglecting to give an optimal learning experience and growth experience to that youngster uh, because of the time misallocation. Rotation. How does rotation look like? Again, you see a lot of times that because of the activity variety that some centers have, that there's in, 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 in rotation one, there's easy activities and very complex activities. And then rotation two, those with the very complex activities in rotation one now have very easy, easy activities. So there's no progression. The question is, how does, how does this do? How does this work in relation to, to the way you look at the program? Is it intentional? Do you, have, do you keep that in mind? Do you visualize that growth process? The reflection methodology and how often. Is there time and does the facilitator have the skills to reflect after each activity, to reflect after each, to every component of the activity, or is it kept for at the end of a day or at the end of a program, which is not that advantageous. We want reflection as often as possible. We want those youngsters to make the connection as often as possible. The integration with theory, very important. We need to make sure that whatever we teach them are founded in solid theory. You know, this is an experiential learning medium and it's fantastic and that's why we love it. But we need to keep in mind that there's a strong theoretical component that we need to consider. There's a strong, strong theoretical foundation. And if we move away from that, we will be busy with mal malpractice. We need to make sure everything we do is... is is, and we need, to, we, need to, we need to talk about this. We need to express this. And, and the participants need to see the theory and the foundation of theory. I'm not only talking about the Word and the Bible and how we engage that, but I'm talking about methodology of adventure-related experiential learning. Prayer is another component in your process. How often do we pray? How often do we pray? We can pray when we start a program. You know, how, how many of you guys have seen a situation where there's a challenging situation and you realize you need to make a stand now in faith and you're right there and then say, right, guys and girls, gather around. <clears throat> and then you proclaim safety and you proclaim caring and you proclaim love in that situation, making sure the youngsters can see how wonderful it is just to engage God in every single situation. As you move from activity A to activity B, glorify his name, proclaim his name, Call out scripture, living the word as part of the activities. This is part of the process. But the question is, how often do you pray? How often do you bring the word in? Because it's important when we look at the process. The facilitator leadership style is important. In some activities, there will be a more of a dominant leadership style. There will be a more of an autocratic leadership style. Um, some people need to be more, more laissez-faire. The question is, when you look at your leaders, how... Which variety of leadership styles can they apply? You have seen them. I've seen them. Some, some youngsters, some leaders, they tend to be very autocratic. They cannot be democratic. They are too afraid to give and to say, listen, but consult. What do you think? They would like to have things in line. So it's an autocratic leadership style. And we know that if we want to have successful programs, we must empower the youngsters in a way that we as leaders step back. We step back. 
we step back and we give them the authority with the equipment, knowledge and skills to be able to take leadership and take charge in situations. Some young leaders cannot do that. They'd like to keep control the whole time. It's important to consider that as part of your process. Um, again, challenge by choice. How do we work that? How do we facilitate that? How prepared are we with regards to that? Very important when we look at the application. We've spoken about that when we looked at the model in the beginning. But recreation, education, development, therapy, and ministry. Each one of those applications have a different scenario around group numbers, around skill of the facilitator, around the role of reflection and reviewing and debriefing. There's a different relation in each one of them. We need to make sure that when we engage in a program, we need to know exactly which of those applications are these clients visiting us. Because if they are here for recreation, we're not going to focus too much on reflection and reviewing because that's not part of the objective. But as they grow in these other areas, there's going to be more and more. Your group numbers for recreation can be 100, 200. But when we start to look at education, development, therapy and ministry, the group numbers need to shrink. Because it's more intentional. It's more focused on the specific outcomes. Then the structure, the rotation, the small groups, large group um, relation, the auto cruise groups. You know, when we have our programs and we look at the process, we can have a situation where we've got small groups and we give each one of those small groups a facilitator or a leader. And we say, off you go. You go and do your, do your thing for the day. Or you can have a big group. And you have a big group briefing and those big groups are then working in smaller groups where you empower some of the some of the group members with skills to do briefing you may have a, an activity set you give that activity set to the group and you say to them off you go and you exercise and practice the activities in that set all over the world we do this in a different way but the structure of our of our program with regards to the small groups is important it may vary, it may, be, it may be different. You may have a situation that as the young people arrive or they wake up in the morning, the group leader gives them a briefing sheet. There's a number of 10 activities. Those 10 activities need to be executed. They need to be getting, getting equipment, etc., etc. And off they go. Another is situation, the group leader are more in charge. They take charge of it. So it's a different way and a different objective for different groups. Then the learning transfer and the, the ability to bring change. It is so important that we make sure that there's enough time to make to, that, that there's intentional learning transfer. Learning transfer happens in any case. These youngsters will go through this experience and they'll go away with some learning. It's going to happen. Whether it's a recreation, any of those applications, it's going to happen. But your intentional structure of a program and your intentional time allocation will ensure that there's definite transfer of learning in these activities so this list is then it brings us to this model again if you look at it now and how it flows and you can see now based on what i have expressed and and how i've gone through these areas there's a lot of things you can still make part of it but it's important that we keep this in mind in the process so our eventual objective is to get to this potential program structure. This thing can be much more than the example that I've got here. It can be much more comprehensive. And this is what we should strive for. We should strive for a program that includes every component as part of an intentional outcome. We need to look at the day, the time, the outcome, the activity, the biblical foundation, the safety considerations that we need for each activity. The learning styles that we're going to focus on. The facilitator that's going to do that, as well as the facilitator skills that we're going to need. We need to look at the facilitator's learning style. And, and, and what style would you suggest as a program manager and a leader? What style should they express and they practice there? What resources will you need? Guys, this list can go on and on. But this is an example or a suggestion for an intentional program to make sure that we get to the objective. We really address the need and we get... We, we, in the end of the day, there's no loopholes in the program. We've thought of everything. We've considered everything in making sure that we are stewards of this wonderful medium of, of adventure-based experiential learning. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed speaking to you. 
Uh, you're more than welcome to contact me on that email address and uh, to be part of, of further expressions and further discussions. Uh, God bless. I, I pray that the Lord will bless each one of you in your ministries. May you be, may you be happy. And may, may this industry of ours all over the world, may it be revived again. May Lord, the Lord bring some, a new season in this that makes us more successful. That creates an awareness about the purpose and the value of adventure-based experiential learning. More than it was before this, this um, COVID-19. God bless and enjoy.